Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hajir Show on the Hajir Network. I am truly honored today to have Dr. Jennifer here with me. And as we promised, we are going to continue talking and bringing awareness about mental health and especially suicide. Dr. Jennifer, please introduce yourself and tell everyone who you are and why we're here today. Well, I'm so, I'm so honored to be here today. So thank you very much for having me on your show and being able to talk about this very important topic. So my name is Dr. Jennifer Tuff. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Pennsylvania, and I'm a certified trauma therapist. So I see clients of all ages with a variety of mental health concerns, but my specialty is Trauma. I also do consulting for organizations around the world on mental health and related topics like suicide, like trauma, like uh, resilience and other issues. So my doctorate is in international psychology with a concentration in trauma services from the Chicago School. Um, and international psychology is a very interesting and needed field. Um, most of psychology that, that we see is very westernized. So international psychology focuses on these concepts and how we can apply them for cultures around the world. Um, I'm also involved in a lot of different mm -hmm. advocacy efforts and, and groups. I just really love working and helping people of, of all different types and, and different groups. Amazing. And and Dr. Jennifer is just being modest here. Um, you are truly someone who I admire and you are a role model. You are oh, very God. young. You have accomplished so much. And I think everyone that is listening to us right now can learn from you, your resilience, uh, your willingness to work, go to school, that. finish your doctorate degree and have a child a whole, whole child yeah. so being a mother <laughs> let's let's just talk about that let's talk about um how did you like do all of that well <laughs> talk about the need for resilience right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I started my private practice in January of 2023 and I had a baby in early March of 2020 three. So I'm that, that crazy person that decided to do both at the same time. I think I defended my dissertation proposal the week before giving birth. Um, and mm -hmm. then I just defended my, my actual, um, full dissertation last month with a almost year and a half year old child. Um, so it's, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of, purposeful effort and it also takes a lot of, of self-care on my part you know I would not be able to do all of these things if I wasn't practicing what I preach and and putting in self-care yeah. um, and I'll, I'll also add that I think you know all the things that I put my hands in you know including your organization and the work that that I hope to continue doing for you are things that I care about you know which makes it a lot easier and more meaningful it doesn't feel as much like work when it's something that you're passionate about and that you gain some sort of intrinsic reward from in my opinion oh my goodness preach exactly <laughs> <laughs> and you know not just uh it took time to like having a child is a huge mm -hmm. huge milestone mm -hmm. and it comes with the love, the fun, but it also come with the responsibility yep. and affect you as a mother, uh, not just financially, physically and sleepless night, mm -hmm. but mentally as well. And I like what you said about, you know, you practice what you preach because most yeah. of like the people that we know, uh, and, and especially me, like I talk about things and sometimes you look and say, I don't even take time to like just breathe or or take care of myself before I move on to the next thing and those kind of pressures you know lead to not just stress it push people to either consume drugs or yeah. alcohol or thinking about ending it all 
Suicide right. is a huge issue. And this is, you know, I had the honor to be there for your dissertation and you have done an amazing job. And not just with your graduation and your, your defense, but choosing that topic. So how did how did you focus on the suicide? Let's let's start about yeah. what the relationship between mental health in general and suicide or someone is willing to to end it all sure yeah um so my my dissertation which again i was so very happy to see you there thank you so much for for being there and being a supportive face um my topic was suicide prevention among university students in japan mm -hmm. so again my my degree is in international psychology so the focus was on a country and a culture other than than my own um mm -hmm. so i picked suicide in japan because that culture that country is one of has one of the highest rates among developed countries in the in the world suicide is a problem everywhere however it really is a global public health concern. Every country, every culture is impacted by it in some way. There's sociocultural factors that influence why someone might die by suicide, how they die by suicide, um, you know, the risk factors, things like that. But it really is a global problem. Um, I also serve on my county's suicide prevention and awareness task force. So I've been um, working in in the field of suicide prevention for a while, just like you said, being in the in the field of mental health and seeing people who are impacted by mental health concerns, suicide is is a big one. It's very prominent. I counsel people of all ages who have struggled and continue to struggle with with uh, suicidal ideation or thoughts of suicide. Uh, and that's like you know, a major thing, and I didn't realize how huge of an issue and an impact, especially when we talk about uh, kids and individuals uh, on a spectrum, yep. or especially, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, we all know about, you know, veterans. I've done shows about, uh, you know, suicide within our marginalized group, right. um, you know, the bullying, everything that is happening now with the social media, with the self-image, with so many things around These us factors, that is affecting the young them. people. And to hear that an eight years old or a 10 years old commit suicide, this blow my mind. But let's let's just start about you know just talk about the mental health like the trauma like give me reasons and give me things that will lead someone to go down that path and yeah what are the signs and Absolutely. how we can stop it before it get to mm -hmm. and become too mm -hmm. late which yeah. is the key right? Recognizing those signs if possible. And if you notice those signs in someone, especially a child, you know, how can you intervene? Um, you know, so there isn't one reason why people die by suicide. You know, I wish it was that simple that it's blank causes people to die by suicide, but it is very complex. And again, like it does depend on, on someone's culture, on, um, you know, their personal history and factors but as you said there are a lot of things that we do know can contribute um bullying as you mentioned negative comparisons on social media or social media use in general has been associated with with increased thoughts of suicide and, and suicidal behaviors um you know there's different reasons why that might be the case it could be bullying online bullying it could be the comparisons it could be um, you know, that that constant quest for likes and for people to, you know, respond to you positively. And if you don't get that, it can lead um, people who are already vulnerable to consider, um, you know, other other ways to cope and in unhealthy ways. Um, other things, trauma. Trauma is a big, big, big predictor of suicide. And trauma is defined as anything that overwhelms your ability to cope and we you know we may talk more about trauma later today um, but trauma is is all the things that you think of when you think of trauma sexual assault um, physical assault 
um, emotional abuse or neglect, but trauma is also subjective. So anything that a person subjectively perceives as, as traumatic um, can cause someone to really have these negative emotions and thoughts that can lead to suicide. Um, so there's, yeah, so there's a lot of things that may contribute mental health issues as well. So if someone has a diagnosed mental health concern, like depression, like anxiety, like PTSD, like bipolar disorder, um, substance use disorders, um, all of these and more are going to put someone at significantly increased risk of dying by suicide. Um, yes, yeah, so you also mentioned, you know, some of the signs, the warning signs. So if you want, we can talk about some of the warning signs that you can look out for. Um, so some people, I'll start by saying, some people don't exhibit any signs. So they just don't. Suicide without any warning is not uncommon. So if you know someone, a loved one who's died by suicide and you didn't see signs, don't beat yourself up. Don't say, well, there must have been something and I and I missed it because often, you know, there you might there might not have been anything. Um that said, you know, there are some common signs that you might notice um, that might indicate someone's thinking about dying by suicide. So those include, you know, the obvious, the most obvious one is talking about wanting to die and saying, I want to kill myself. Um, I always recommend people take it seriously, even if you think they, they might be seeking attention, even if you don't think they're actually going to do it. It's better to be safe than sorry in those kinds of situations. Um, you know, if someone is talking about wanting to die by suicide, it doesn't always mean they're going to die, but it does always mean something's going on, right? So it it means that something's going on and we want to examine that. Um, other warning signs that someone might exhibit are talking about feeling hopeless, talking about being a burden on others, you know, nobody, I'm, I'm just a drain on my family, um, engaging in self-destructive behaviors. So that could be self-harm, cutting, um, risky drugs and alcohol, use um, excessive gambling, sexual behaviors that are dangerous, things like that. Um, you might see people sleeping too much or too little. That's often a sign of, of a number of mental health conditions, um, withdrawing or isolating from loved ones or not engaging in things that they used to really enjoy. The warning sign um, and, and extreme mood swings, you know, so going from, from hot to cold, that can also be be a sign something to keep on keep an eye out for you know one thing you said uh i think it's very important to uh talk about a little bit more um you know when you see signs or someone come to you and say they are thinking about killing themselves um regardless of how you feel uh if that person is just looking you you hear that a lot like yeah. oh yeah. this person is just looking for attention you know attention. but you don't want to find um the hard way first of yeah. all mm -hmm. um one of the questions that we have is um talking about it if if you yeah. saw the signs and said to someone are you thinking about killing yourself uh would that make them want to do it are, are you encouraging them uh or it's okay how safe is it to approach someone and say, you know, are you truly, th are you thinking about harming yourself? So it is a hundred percent safe and encouraged. So exactly like you said, there's this belief that if I ask someone if they want to kill themselves and then I'm planting that idea in their head and that, you know, now they're going to do it. But research has shown that that is false. That is a myth. You can't plant the idea of suicide in someone's head by asking them about it. Um, on the contrary, you know, by asking them about it, they might feel a lot of relief and say, oh, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for someone to really just ask me. Um, you know, so, and that is the number one, the first course of action is just ask someone. I get it. It's hard. You know, we don't want to, it's a delicate subject, um, but asking someone to just ask directly. You might, um, you might 
point it out in a way tying it to to behaviors you've noticed like mm -hmm. hey I've noticed that you know you, you've been isolating a lot or I noticed that you've been you know talking about feeling worthless and like a burden burden you know have you been having thoughts of suicide asking asking something like that can help broach the topic in a sensitive way but just ask you know if you have doubts that that's the big thing that that's one of the biggest thing and uh, even before i study um you know became in the healthcare and we had the psych uh, they were the teachers were hammering that in our head you know don't feel like you're putting ideas in mm -hmm. somebody's brain uh if someone is not thinking about uh, committing suicide then you're not going to put that in their yeah, head yeah and they'll say no and you know yeah well, and move on and yeah. if they are then you're going to find out because if someone is thinking about it and talking about it, that's cry for help. Can you just give us a little bit about crying for help, like how people can can see that? Right. Yeah. So, again, like all of those signs that you might see can be a a cry for help or something that they're indicating something's wrong so again it might not necessarily mean they are going to engage in in a suicidal action um but it's them projecting this something's going on and this is the way that that it's coming out for me so again asking that way even if again even if it isn't thoughts of suicide you know, maybe they will give you an answer of, you know, yeah, you're, you know, you're right. I have been isolating a lot. No, I haven't been. I don't want to kill myself, but but I have been feeling really depressed lately, you know, mm -hmm. so you can get some sort of answers there. And, and, you know, depending on your role, whether it's parent, friend, teacher, counselor, you know, you can help in, in your way or point yeah. them in the right direction. Perfect. So the the steps are somebody thought about committing suicide and then develop an action or a plan. Yeah. Let's right. um, plan right. and then carry him on with that plan. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's what we usually like. So counselors, when we when we do suicide assessments, you know, we ask, are you having those thoughts? OK, a lot of people do. You know, it's not uncommon. I don't want to stigmatize having those thoughts. It's like I said, it's common in many mental health conditions. Um, but then we ask, OK, well, do you have intent on, on acting upon these thoughts? And, and have you thought of a plan? Because that can indicate that there's some some seriousness behind these mm -hmm. thoughts. It's not just a mm -hmm. thought at this point. They want to act upon it. OK, OK. So what what are some of the questions if you mind don't mind me yeah. uh -uh, having you say it so everybody out there can benefit from it and before we do the signs um the emotions i know we are mm -hmm. a very fast based um society right now and everybody wants to look perfect don't want to we want to mm -hmm. be numb mm -hmm. so i want you to talk about that the that uh the feeling is a normal feeling you have to be anxious when you see something you have to be scared if something is scary mm -hmm. you have to feel down the ups and downs this mm -hmm. is part of life when does it become a problem that need addressing and when is it just a a regular hormonal mm -hmm. body life mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that's that's the first part of the question and then yeah. that um you know the numb society like mm -hmm. we want everyone to be happy all day yeah. uh, or just be in a robot. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's a great question because we, we all feel feelings. Feelings exist for a reason. They serve to, you know, let others know how we're feeling. They serve to protect ourselves. Um, I always, I have been a lot now talking about inside out. Have you seen Inside Out, the movie, and Inside Out too? Because they really do a yes. great job of portraying, you know, emotions, especially in a child. Um, and the new one has, in addition to joy, sadness, fear, disgust, it has envy, anxiety, uh, ennui, and embarrassment. And all these feelings are normal, right? So you can have anxiety without having an anxiety disorder. 
everyone has anxiety sometimes. You can feel sad without having clinical depression. We all feel sad sometimes. Emotions are part of life. They're response to normal things in our life. You know, we all have times that we kind of, you know, float through periods of, of happiness and then dip into times of sadness, depending on a situation, something that, that occurs. Um, kind of like you said, there is this um, kind of, what do they call it? Toxic positivity. I've been hearing that that term and some influencers or, or on social media this like you have to be <laughs> do I have a story for you <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> not now later <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah it's because it's toxic because it's not number one is not a, attainable um for us to be happy all the time um so it makes people feel guilty if they're not if you know, I should be grateful every second of every day and I should be peaceful and present and mindful and, and living in, in this state of joy. Nobody does that. Even the people preaching it online, it's not real. It's not attainable. It's going to make you feel, um, you know, hard on yourself and guilty and, and perpetuate this, this negative feelings. If, if you feel like you have to live up to, you know, this ideal of only positive feelings all the time. Um, so again, like inside out shows, you know, there's a balance, there's a balance of, of all of these feelings. Now, when does it become a problem? So generally from a clinical standpoint, you know, emotions, well, there's criteria for certain, you know, disorders. Um, but generally when it interferes with your functioning is what I like to say. So if you're having anxiety, um, and it's, it's interfering with, with your functioning so it's happening and it's preventing you from going to to work or school um if you're having you know a lot of sadness that is interfering with your ability to socialize um then that can really indicate that there's something deeper going on so you know be mindful if you feel like these negative emotions are um, mm -hmm. you know, preventing you from living your life in in the way that you want then that can be a good time to talk to a counselor and see what's going on. I 100% agree with that. Um, and that goes with depression, with anything that you feel it's, um, it's affecting your life. Too much of anything is not a good thing, per yeah, se, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, about toxic positivity, <laughs> about that. <laughs> My girls used to say to me that I have toxic positivity. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I'm always someone that look at the glass half full mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. seeing people, people are all good unless, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, when I was younger, that used to be like it. Now I see things, <laughs> I <Right>. see different <laughs> things, but I still, I still, keep on my positivity I still want to please believe that people intentionally I mean there's people that that people who are bad period but there are people that are just their circumstances are different I like to give people the benefit of the doubt uh when something bad happened to me I don't process it all the time uh because in my mind the way I lived my life and I seen so much I know I am blessed and there are people who are going through worse than what I'm going through. That used to be an issue between me and the girls. Uh, you know, when they come home and say uh, they had a tough day or whatever, I listen to them and all of that. But then I start automatically bringing up the topic that there are kids in the world who are hungry. Mm -hmm. They're homeless. They're going through way more issues than you. Mm -hmm. And it until they sat me down and they said, other people going through a lot, but that doesn't mean doesn't our issues me, are yeah, not big. It doesn't me. minimize. Yeah. You're basically minimizing yeah. our feelings. So it's like uh, you just have to find that balance. It's, you it's can tough be for positive. parents. It's really mm -hmm. tough for parents because yeah. parents, you want to, you know, they say something, your kids say this bad thing happened or they feel sad and you want to cheer them up. You want yeah. them to focus on the positives and you want to say, but you have this going and but think of but all find these that fine line right <laughs> find, but it doesn't find, you know for yeah but it find that yeah. fine line exactly because the kids yeah. can feel 
you know, I hear this from teen, my teen clients a lot. Like my parents just don't, you know, I just want them to sometimes say, gosh, yeah, that sucks. That sucks that yeah. you're going through that. Like yeah. I hear you, yeah. you know, they want to yeah. just be validated. Um, yeah. And, and if you yeah, can exactly, relate, a fine line. it's a fine line. And if you can't really relate, like I did finally, when my girls are older, you know, I try, you know, you try as a parent, you try when they got older, I said, sometime I might not relate to the issues and, and you seeing it as big, uh, because to me, when you have so much going on in your life, sometimes not much that fade you, not much become an issue for you. Like mm -hmm. I've seen it, done it, been there, done that, walk around. Those songs okay. are not for a <laughs> for no reason. They they have a for reason. But anyways, once you realize that, just you know, move on and 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 be positive, be positive, but also you know, allow yeah. some realistic expectation. Right. Yeah, if we, no, you're, if we say you're that. not wrong at all. The positivity exercises, I do those in my counseling sessions because they, you know, they work. It's helpful to list things you're grateful for. It's very helpful to, you know, um, practice different exercises that might help you realize the good things and compare yourself, um, you know, favorably to other people yeah. and situations. Yeah. Um, positive thinking, the power of positive thinking yeah. is huge on, um, again, it's just a, a balance, you know, you can do all that positive stuff, but don't, you know, deny or minimize the, the tough stuff happens, you know, because sometimes mm -hmm. that just needs to be sat with. Yeah. And don't move on too fast. I learned that the hard way. Give yourself <laughs> a time to go through the whole process, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. depression, the anger, and no two people are alike. You might pass mm. one stage fast. Somebody might stay in that stage longer. There is a uh, comment here. I really, before we, mm -hmm. uh, I have you talk about um, staying on the stages. There right. is a, a comment here I really want you to address. Okay. And I'm not going to say anything. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to put my opinion. Uh, Ronak, <laughs> her name is Ronak. She said, I think being soft, a soft person and emotional makes them, makes you get depressed from everything. So I would want to know, so being emotion, being sensitive makes you more depressed. Is that what? what the uh, no, uh, what yeah. she, I think what she meant is if, uh, you get depressed because you're a soft person. Drown up. If I'm not getting you right, please correct me. She said, I think being soft, like being a soft person. Yeah, like, okay. for example, if you are a soft person and emotional, someone who yeah. like an emotional person, Feels... uh, it makes you depressed from everything. So that's uh I think that's her um she that's that's what she thinks. Like if, if someone is soft right. and emotional, they get depressed from everything i disagree with that and i agree to some extent but let's yeah. hear it from the doctor i mean too, what, what depre like clinical depression is caused by a lot of factors it's not you know personality traits do have a role in that right so like people who are extra sensitive yeah that that can certainly put people more at, at risk of depression so like certain personality traits definitely doesn't mean that every person who's like really sensitive um you know, is going to be depressed, but that can be a personality trait um, that's more prone to depression, but also genetics, also environment, also, you know, your experiences, trauma history, um, and just the physiology, a lot of um, different factors really are the ones that contribute to depression. So it's saying, you know, it's just X that causes Y, um, you know, isn't, isn't always helpful. Um, and then if it, you know, can make the person feel like something's wrong with them or they caused it. Um, it's, it's for every mental health condition, depression, anxiety, again, all of them, it's not as simple as like one thing caused it. Even, even post-traumatic stress disorder, which would seem to have, you know, one cause, the trauma, there's a lot of things underneath that because two people can be in, in the exact same situation you know, so say a car accident, two people can be in the same car, the same accident, one person gets PTSD, the other person doesn't, and it's because of other factors, again, genes, uh, mm -hmm. personality, maybe past traumas, maybe family support or lack of family support, all these things. So, 
yeah, I guess my answer would be like, it's not, it's not really that, that simple, but I do understand the, like the thought that, yeah, certain personality traits might, might feel things um, more, you know, in a, in a stronger so, way. Some people are more prone to, um, you know, uh, with ge their genetic, with their type of personality, yeah. just to some, what Dr. Jennifer said, uh, you are correct. Some people could be emotional, like their their emotions are different. Somebody is, yeah. you say that that's a tough person. I mean, when you say that, yeah. uh, it means like some of their character, the way they approach things, maybe their previous trauma, yeah. things that maybe. they've been through, prepare them. And and you hear that word a lot, like or or comments is like, oh, this person has thick skin. You know, yeah. this is all goes into your uh, comment, Raunak. Thank you for for sending that. Yeah. Abdul Azim said, but suicidal behavior are there before this big bang of media, and I agree with you because mm -hmm. I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mean it this way, um, yeah. Abdul Azim and everyone. I didn't mean it just started with the media, but, um, and, and every, everything is being right. there. Like right, autism, yeah. Autism, um, uh, all uh, mental uh, disorders, anything existed before. Right. Now our ability to talk about it, for us to reach people, like we're sitting here, our videos are viewed globally. Uh, yeah. you know that that get the point across so a lot of people talk about it a lot of people hear about it there come now it is yeah. on yeah. your face but yeah. what I meant by social media not the existence of suicide or mental health disorders what I meant is it exposed us like when you see someone if, if you're already someone who are, who are prone to compare themselves to yeah. others have low self-esteem or they believe from what they see that the image is supposed to be a certain way. You have to look this way. You have to talk this way. You have to dress this way. Like if there is a standard, a beauty standard, let's just put it this way. And that's for another day. Right. We, had a, yeah. we had a whole show about um, oh, standards. But um, mm -hmm. do you want to add something to his comment? Yeah, right. So, so absolutely, like suicide wasn't caused by the advent of social media um you know at all there's a lot of things like i said that can contribute to suicide but what research has shown is that like social media does increase depression and, and does contribute to these thoughts of suicide for especially young people and it, it is for those reasons like comparison um you know like maybe isolating from from the quote-unquote real world because they're they're on social media, um, like this, the bullying, you know, there's a lot of things about social media that can make the problem worse. There's good things about social media, you know, mm -hmm. there's good things about, um, we are on social media, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, we can share information, yeah. positive information, helpful information. Um, you know, it's interesting that that mental health, I mean, mental health is, is stigmatized in almost every culture yeah. around the world still, unfortunately. But I, what I've seen and what research has shown in recent years with, you know, the advent of social media um, is that we're talking about it more. Yeah. You know, we're Thank talking you. about it more. I think that's we, it. Yeah. We're destigmatizing it little by little, chipping away. Uh, more youth are open to therapy. You know, there's yeah. in, in the United States, more kids and teens want to go to therapy. The problem is that they, you know, problems of access of getting it. Yeah. You know, yeah. but but it's in, very encouraging that, you know, more people are like, hey, yeah, I want, you know, I want to talk about my feelings with someone and, and therapy is. I think on our second, do you see how I put that on our second <laughs> a show with Dr. Jennifer? Smooth, right? Yeah, she's <laughs> booking me for talk. another one already. <laughs> I'm booking you already for this <laughs> a second one. We can talk about um, the therapy. Uh, part like mm -hmm. when you discuss culture like your your dissertation mm -hmm. was not mm -hmm. here college right. student in Japan mm -hmm. yeah. and you know so the culture play a huge part not just yeah. on the stigma about mental health but also stigma on how you are um, uh, treating the, mm -hmm. the symptoms mm -hmm. or the disorders Absolutely. that you it's have not uh, one size fits all by any means yep. 
but we will we will talk about that. We have so okay. many questions, and I, I promise <laughs> you guys, <laughs> right. I am going to get to okay. your questions or comments. I'm going to read them to her, and if I miss any, please write it again, and I'll see it. So Al Azim said is uh, is kind of uh, bursting out, and he put it in a question, like question mark. So I I asked them to clarify. Do you mean suicide is kind of bursting out, or or uh, yeah, he said, yep, he, he responded. Mm -hmm. So he said, is suicide a kind of bursting out? Well, uh, bursting out like, what do, you, what do you mean? Give me a little more. Like, is it increasing or is it kind of like a... Like, you know how um, people lash out or say, oh, this oh, person okay. have a, a temper tantrum. Is it um, a way of a coping mechanism or is it a way of just being you know when you say this child right, right, right. is not yeah. listening or or just right. like trying to be well difficult. yeah okay all right so yeah so i think i understand so suicide most suicides occur in the heat of the moment you know certainly there's suicides that are that are planned and people take you know hours days weeks longer and, and plan the details but often suicides occur in an acute state of crisis you know, so they um, have, have all this stuff going on and, and it gets to that breaking point mm -hmm. and then they they do something. So, you know, so in that regard, yeah, it is like the um, this this for, for many people, again, like this momentary decision that unfortunately yeah. is a permanent, permanent one. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to the need for suicide prevention methods that that make it harder for someone to die by suicide so gun thank gun, you you know gun laws um if we make it harder for people to access guns then in the heat of the moment when they are having that you know crisis that feeling hopefully ideally it passes you know they do something else they um you, you know the, the feelings go away for at least long enough for them not to kill themselves um you know that's the idea behind putting up barriers at train stations and bridges that if we can prevent them you know make it harder for them to do it in this moment maybe they won't do it again and there's a lot of research on that that that, that does you know work without someone um you know substituting the method for something else yeah so i hope i, I hope answered that, that answer. right if not oh, yeah if not did. let us know <laughs> Um, uh, 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 let me know, let us know if uh, yeah. that answer your question. <clears throat> but I want us to say something about with this specifically. Um, you know, when you see the early signs, early detections, mm -hmm. early prevention, speaking about it, raising awareness. You know, being observant. If you're a parent or a friend or someone, and you see someone around you, whether that in school or at work someone who is exhibiting those signs and speaking about it or yeah. you know don't don't be afraid of going ask them right. you're not putting ideas in their head right. first second when you know early you will assess and see if they have a plan if right. they say to you that oh i'm going to do it by cutting my arm or um mm -hmm. you know you know um uh, f buying a gun uh going and jumping off right. something you will find a way to prevent that person have them watch monitor that's why right. there is a suicide watch you know right. But the, the other part of this is the accessibility to guns. And I'm not someone who's telling people what to do or what not right. to do. But, you know, so many lives that we lost because of the accessibility. You have the right to bear arm if you are not a violent person, if you're not like in domestic violent dispute, if you're not someone who's suicidal. And not everyone will go and commit themselves and get help. Right. Some people yeah. are suicidal and they walk in among us, but to make it easy for them to go walk in right. and buy something, right. they should be a weight. And we, I know a lot of people advocated for this. If someone wanted to buy, um, when you do your uh, background check, mental health check on the person before they purchase, right? Also, it got to be a weight period. Right. You can, we can't make it easy to the point that you are upset. Like, uh, uh, his in his question, someone is bursting out and going in, buying it, and ending their life. So that shouldn't be the easy mm -hmm. thing. 
Uh, yeah. Aliyah uh, I, said, yeah. if, oh, you want to add something? No, I was just going to say, I, I agree. You know, my gun laws and gun control is its own issue. You know, my we we have guns in my family. We, you mm -hmm. know, we're responsible. I don't want to take anyone's guns away, but it's about being responsible. And, you know, like you said, making it harder, whether it's just gun locks, whether if you have someone in your, your family or in your mm -hmm. household who has depression or, or has exhibited these signs of suicide, mm -hmm. you know, lock up your guns, you know, make sure yeah. they can't have access to them. If yeah. you are that person and you have access to guns, you know, give them to your neighbors, give them to a friend for, you know, until you're feeling better just make for a it a period of time mm -hmm. yeah. alia alia said winter is approaching what's your advice to those mm -hmm. uh is yeah yeah especially um a double suffering uh yeah. homesick winter mm -hmm. depression mm -hmm. and a lot of people will have seasonal disorder yeah. what did i tell you yeah. we're gonna have to have round two three four five yeah. <laughs> This yes, is going it's to be our therapy season, session. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real thing. Seasonal affective disorder, the acronym SAD, SAD. You know, we get, mm -hmm. a lot of people get sad when our we have less sunlight. It's, you know, it's kind of like a biological thing too. When we do have less sunlight, you know, our bodies react. Um, so my tips are, you know, number one, recognize if that's you. If you're kind of one of those people who, who notes, hey, when the, it starts to get colder out and darker out I feel sadder um you know note that and make a make a plan so it might include therapy it might be okay I need to go see a therapist because it's really tough for me um or it might just be different lifestyle changes like okay this time of year I need to engage in some more self-care activities I need to go to the gym more I need to make sure I'm spending more time with friends I need to make sure I'm doing my hobbies I need to make sure I'm you know eating sleeping just generally taking care of myself extra extra you know much this this time of year because it is harder for me you know so that's what that's what I would recommend Perfect, perfect. Um, there are several questions, and I'm putting information about um, uh, seasonal um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, depress uh, depressive disorder, and I am going to read the next one. And even like, and hopefully, to, uh, I know we want to move on, but just like the holidays are tough for. Yes, please talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, feel free. Yeah, to holidays can be a big, big trigger. Um, winter yeah. holidays and and um you know, because of family relationships or missing someone um, or and a lot of factors that can be, it can be triggering. And in places where war is happening currently mm -hmm. and my hometown, Sudan, as mm -hmm. all of you know, it's been struggling with, uh, you know, since the revolution with uh, the war currently since April of uh, last year. This is affecting people in more than, you know, you can imagine, more ways than you can imagine. Yeah. Um, they, no, uh, many people don't have a place to call home. A lot of people are refugees. That's another yeah. story. A lot of people are um, sitting in camps. A lot of people are not able to leave. A lot of people are refugees in neighboring countries. Some people are displaced in their country mm -hmm. just in a different mm -hmm. spot so being homesick like Alea said um that could be uh, a trigger or a reason right. for someone to seek help and mm -hmm. not being in a war or not being in a place of trauma doesn't mean that you're not going to be affected the same mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. um you know uh, a lot of people lost memories and and maybe mm -hmm. somebody will look at it and say well it's replaceable not everything is replaceable yeah. and your your our reaction towards the things that we lose whether this is material whether it's being human whether it's being a place whether it being just being you being a human thinking about others and knowing that someone out there whether it's in sudan mm -hmm. or any part of the world that they are not able to find food they're not safe they don't have shelter. They don't have water. Uh, some of them are at risk, high risk of, um, you know, um, violence and especially mm -hmm. gender based mm -hmm. violence, mm -hmm. human trafficking, mm -hmm. you know, rape, uh, yeah. uh, you know, death. Like those are all yeah. things that are going Absolutely. to affect. And if it doesn't lead you to wanting to commit suicide, yep. it's just going to affect you some yeah. 
in yeah. some way or another. Yeah. Yeah. I would, you know, encourage people if you're interested in learning more about, you know, well, there's a lot of things you could read about that, but but I'm thinking of, of something called Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, where at mm-hmm. the very base we have just these very human needs of the food, shelter, um, you know, and if you don't have that. You can't move up to, you know, these other needs of of stability, of mental, mental stability, of socialization, of self-actualization, you know. Mm -hmm. So when you don't have those very basic things, it's going to make it much, much harder. Harder. Yeah. Uh, Another question from Sharmaya. Uh, What steps can someone take to create a stronger support system to prevent suicidal thoughts from escalating? Ooh, good okay. question it. yeah it's a great question um yeah so you could i would sit down and think either you know if you do have someone that you can do it with like a counselor um or or you know anyone that, that is supportive and, and make a list um or you could just do it by yourself but think about all the various social opportunities and circles so it might be family immediate family extended family um look at friends acquaintances look at neighbors look at community members look at um you know school work any of these these um you know circles these groups might be opportunities to develop or maintain social relationships um and if you're you're struggling if you don't have these opportunities i would encourage making you know going to community events spiritual religious groups can be good ones for that to find people that you know share share uh, beliefs with you um or interests you know if there's just if you're, if you're into baking joining a baking group or or so you know whatever it might might be a sporting um activity um those are good ways to find more people Abdel Azim, you are on point. He just said the same thing. He was uh, commenting the same thing. The same thing you said. He said, "I think spirituality is yeah. strongly connected. People um, uh, can resist those negative notions and tendencies." So, yeah. two things: spiritual spirituality, whatever your religious, whatever you believe in. A lot of people hold on to the faith. Um, and, and believing on the things that just putting your faith on something that you don't see, okay. you know, God, uh, uh, Allah, uh, if you do Salah, Quran, you read your Bible, you read your Quran, you read your Torah, whatever religious that you were affiliated with, or some people are free spirits. Some people just believe in okay. God and they don't do whatever okay. that makes you cope. And also, he said, connected people, like um, having people that you're connected with can can help you. So that was um, that was Xavier who who said that. Uh, that's uh, uh, no, that's Abdul Azim. His name is oh, okay. Abdel-Azim. So you're Abdul, you are absolutely right. So that you know, both social connection and spirituality are mm-hmm. considered, you know, what we call protective factors in all cultures around the world so you know protective factors are things that help protect us from issues of mental health from suicide so you know these are things um that that make it less likely that we will um you know be at risk for suicide and and be at risk for depression or or other mental health issues doesn't mean we won't doesn't mean they won't but it's a protection um and research has found like around the world socialization having a support system is a big protective factor it doesn't look the same for everyone for some people your social circle might be you know your parents for others it might be your friends for other people it might be you know your community but having some sort of social support is a big protective factor and then like you said also some form of spirituality it might be religion it might be you know just seeing um some sense of purpose some sort of um meaning but that also gives yeah. people a reason to live and a reason to continue to fight so that's a big protective factor a belonging um uh, a cause that you care about yeah. like yep. a, that you care about and yep. like uh, yeah. you said at the beginning what makes a huge difference is doing something that not just bringing 
money to you, like as a job, mm -hmm. but also bringing yeah. joy, Gives you purpose, um, mm -hmm. purpose yeah. of life. Okay, so another question: How can I develop a safety plan with someone who is struggling with suicidal thoughts? Okay, so I would, you know, I think it's always best i feel like for them to do it in a, a therapeutic environment just in case they are high risk so that they can you know a trained person can help them through it but the general components of a safety plan that you know would be valuable are to help them identify things that they can do when they get those thoughts okay so healthy things they can do it might be i'm going to take a walk it might be I'm going to watch a TV show that gets my mind off it. It might be I'm going to pray. Whatever those things are for them, help them recognize what they are. And then also have them recognize people they can contact. So, and and write them down, write down the phone numbers, have this whole plan somewhere that they can see it. So, you know, if, if they say, oh, I can contact my friend, you know, Jennifer, okay, what's Jennifer's phone number? Let's make sure you yeah. have it in your phone and you can contact her. Okay, and what if Jennifer doesn't answer the phone? Who else? Um, also have them identify emergency numbers. So in the United mm -hmm. States, we have 911 and we have 988, which is the National Suicide Crisis Lifeline. You can text it, you can call it 24 hours a day. Um, and instead of 911, the people who answer the calls there are trained mental health professionals. So it's not just police. Mm -hmm. um, help them identify what it, you know, what those numbers are for, for them. If it is outside of the U.S., maybe help them recognize the closest crisis centers to them. If they want to physically go to a hospital, if they feel like it's necessary, make sure they know where they could go. Um, and also in that safety plan, like we talked about before, talk about how they can make their environment safer. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, you know, in our safety plan, we're going to put our, our guns away. We're going to make sure we don't have access to, you know, these things that, that could be dangerous. We're going to lock up pills or, you know, just plan for safety in, in, yeah. in all these ways. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to say something to a very dear friend of mine here, Lori, um, who her son was my biggest an inspiration um he was on the spectrum he's the one that taught me autism even before my son existed and unfortunately justin took his life uh march of this I'm year so um um with the gun uh that uh, so lori, lori said my situation was so difficult he never said anything to anyone and that's one thing. He was such an amazing child. And uh, when I started Karimi's mission, uh, Justin took his life a couple of months after the start of Karimi's mission. So uh, the first initiative that we did, we dedicated the uh, event for Justin's memory. And we are working on a um, some form. Uh, we still didn't finalize uh, is it going to be a scholarship fund or a help with mental health? Uh, but it is called Justin's Journey. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give more information about that, but we're going to work closely with, with Lori. Uh, and I am so, yeah, like, I can't even say um, how much I appreciate. It is not easy for a mother to lose her, her son, the one that she spent all her life taking care of, trying to pave the way. Uh, she struggled so much into changing policies. He was going to be 22. So 21 years ago, uh, autism, the resources were not mm -hmm. as good mm -hmm. as now, the knowledge, mm -hmm. everything, and she struggled. And just to lose the child, no words can can make okay. this, yep. you know, get better. But the fact that she was so brave and in his name, she was able and willing to come and talk to parent, raise awareness about suicide. And she's going to be our advocate. She's going to be the one that always going to talk about uh, suicide. And uh, we will give share more information about Justin's journey. Mm -hmm. But this is this was a um, point in my life. That changed everything. I always, mm -hmm. with my other organization, we talk about suicide prevention. We talk about safety, you know, but mm -hmm. I was not like 
at it like how I'm going to be now. So watch out. Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. going to work on uh, changing policies, doing uh, so much so we don't lose another Justin. We don't lose mm -hmm. anyone. So just um, before we move to the next, and I know we're almost running out of time, I don't know what, uh, Lori, how can we be good friend to her? Uh, we uh, try, but just in the open right now for anyone that listening to someone who's struggling or someone who lost someone to suicide, how can we support in a way that is going to be beneficial to them? Uh, Lori, I'm so sorry for your, for your loss. There are no words. It really is an unimaginable incomprehensible loss to for a mother to lose a child and and when it is by suicide that can be complicated because there are so many feelings surrounding it so i'm so unbelievably sorry um i applaud you for speaking about it speaking out about it and and using this experience and his memory and legacy to fuel change um so yeah i mean how do we support someone like lori um, I think we, you know, we number one, make sure that they know they're not alone. You know, you're, you're unfortunately not alone because there are many parents out there who have lost children to suicide. Um, we, we make sure that they have these resources. We fund and advocate for resources to, to help them, you know, to help parents and loved ones get the help that they need, right, from that trauma, um, and then I, you know, I think we, we do what we can to make sure this doesn't happen to other, other kids, other adults, other, you know, people in general, you know, we, we keep fighting and we, um, hope to learn from, um, the, the horrors and the tragedies. Yeah. Um, another question, can those sort of people who likely resort to committing suicide, show some kind of uh, manifestation? Uh, like behaviors um, or? I, I believe that's what he meant, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, and again, like, like you said, with Lori's case, he didn't exhibit signs. So we don't mm -hmm. always see signs in that, um, you know, that happens. Um but sometimes you do see signs like we talked about these these then they can be behavioral um you know the the reckless behaviors or self-destructive behaviors can be a, a physical manifestation of the inner turmoil um i i think of self-harm a lot so yeah. you know when we talk about self-harm we talk about cutting it does not always mean you know it often often actually doesn't people who engage in self-harm doesn't mean that they want to die but you know, it is something that's associated with it. Um, so you relieve some of like the that. stress. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you might see things like that. Lori said, my son took his life on 318. Zero indication that this was mm -hmm. his plan. Often mm -hmm. I ask myself, what did I miss? Right. I miss nothing. Uh, his mind was set. So yeah. before you respond to her comment, I'm going to say, Lori, um, I can vouch for you. I know you for many years. Uh, you were one of the best mothers that I ever known. You were a role model to me. You and Justin actually truly paved the road. You were there for a reason, for Kareem, and you're going to pave the road for so many other kids out there. There is nothing that you've done. There is nothing that you missed because he was so good to the moment that he left you and his mind was set. And I think it, if there is something that we can, like we can't automatically as a person, you want to blame something and you blame mm -hmm. yourself first. You don't want to do that. We can blame the person fault, who Lori. sold them the gun, yeah. you know? Yeah, so it is not your fault. You didn't miss anything. And yes, his mind was set. I can yeah. say that to you and now. Uh, I'll let Dr. Jennifer uh, right. no, respond I mean, to yeah, this. No, I just, you said it perfectly. It just kind of, I, I think I said in the beginning too, like there's, there's often times when people don't exhibit any signs, 
at all. You know, it's not uncommon for people to die by suicide and nobody sees anything. So, um, you know, it's a natural to, to ask yourself, what did I miss? You know, I should have looked out for this, but, um, you know, that it happens. There are those cases where there aren't, aren't signs. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, um, there is, um, what's the subtitle for the discussion? Oh, okay. So the discussion today is mental health and mm -hmm. we are just scratching the surface. This is, <laughs> you know, we had, uh, we had, um, couple Arabic um, show about mental health. I had a few people that talk about it. I have um, therapist prior to Dr. Jennifer. Dr. Jennifer is an amazing, amazing woman who's going to, whenever she has time, she is more than welcome. Our doors are open. Whenever and you have me. Uh, I will tell you guys um, when she's going to be with us next. Um, what are some strategies to help manage overwhelming feeling or thoughts of suicide and we are hitting two o'clock i know we can sit here and answer your comments and <laughs> questions i want to thank all of you you know i love you all and i know this is a topic that much needed and we i promise i personally promise that i'm gonna harass dr jennifer until she give us another day and i, I will, will gladly come back and answer <laughs> okay. all of those questions yeah <clears throat> Okay, so this is, I'm sorry, but uh, I think this will be our last uh, question. All the other questions, I'm going to give you an, a question to um, uh, to answer for us, but all the other questions that we didn't answer, they're not going to go to waste. We are going to write them out, send mm, them to mm -hmm. Dr. Jennifer, and we're going to come answer them the first thing before we start our next uh, show with her. So... Um, uh, okay. All right. This is a very good topic. Uh, you got the question for um from uh uh Shermaya, I think. Uh there is a question about the war. Um it says since you mentioned war of Sud in Sudan, it will much be appreciated if you share advice to get out of the difficult time uh, uh, in the conflict uh, and mentally, like basically um, mental health uh, avoids any negative effects. So how people, maybe in a minute, um, tell us like how people can, I know this is not gonna be enough in a minute. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, yeah, so it is a, it's a complex question. And, and so I like to conceptualize like overcoming hardships, like, like war, like any other trauma is like a scale or a seesaw. So on the one hand, you have the, this negative things, the trauma factors, war, poverty, abuse, um, you know, mental health issues, all these things kind of weighing you down. And then on the other side is those protective factors. So we kind of talked about for some people, um, you know, spirituality it doesn't have to be religion necessarily, you know, but belief in something greater than yourself, um, socialization, having good support system, engagement in hobbies, things that make you feel good. Um, you know, being, being good at something, feeling confidence, having these, these things that are protective can tip the scale in the opposite direction. So, you know, overcoming a hardship, um, really is about, protect, you know, having an accumulation of, of protective factors. Um, again, it's not a one size fits all. So even though connection, social support might be a universal, um, protective factor it's gonna look different for everyone so it really you know really um, is, is tailored to the individual and their their experience but those are some of the things that can can help lighten the load thank you dr jennifer for giving us 
this whole hour and it's been beneficial for everyone that is watching and is going to continue benefiting people and we normally do a lightning round at the end but um i think we're going to save it for the next time to make sure that you are coming next time thank you I'll very much for being here and thank you everyone for watching thank you so much. commenting thank you so much thank you